So good morning and good afternoon, good evening. It depends on where you are located. Uh, today, uh, we have pleasure to invite Professor Nick Oblensky uh, to join us. Uh, and this is the Meet the Also webinar series. Uh, it is our 22nd time to conduct this webinar. And uh, I think in the last 21 uh, episode, uh, we have uh, more than 500,000 uh, online views. And uh, we used to uh, invite uh, like the Nobel uh, Prize uh, laureate in economy, uh, both uh, Robert Oman and uh, Robert Wilson. Uh, they were also uh, the guest speaker for this webinar series. So today, uh, the topic that we were going to discuss about is uh, the, the, the leadership. And it's not just the leadership, but the future uh, leadership and also the future uh, human uh, resource uh, management. So uh, today, it is really our pleasure to invite Professor Nick Oblensky, uh, given that he uh, is one of the best uh, selling book um, not only in China, uh, but also in the global as well. And uh, the book topic is called Complex Adaptive Leadership, uh, Embracing Paradox and Uncertainty. So uh, I think it is really a, a timely topic uh, given uh, because of COVID-19, the world is changing, transforming, and the paradigm is being redesigned. So I think a lot of things is uh, happening, not only uh, COVID-19, uh, but also like, uh, for example, the, the trend and the, uh, for using the contractor like Uber and the Grab, and also uh, the algorithm intelligence is also uh, getting popular. So in the future, we are not only have the problem of AI employee, uh, but uh, maybe more importantly, we are also going to have AI manager. So how do we deal with those of issue and uh, how do we uh, cope with those issue? Uh, that will be something uh, we will discuss uh, later on. So uh, let me also take this opportunity uh, to introduce Professor Nick Oblensky. So Nick's uh, key specialty is improving organizational-wide leadership uh, capability, innovation, and enabling effective change, uh, supporting top leadership team, and engaging a full organization in leading. And uh, uh, his academic experience include fellow and program director at London Business School Center for Management Development, and he was also a uh, professor and a visiting professor in many uh, leading business school, uh, like the INSEAD and uh, Erasmus University in Netherlands. And uh, he also used to work with uh, the army for 12 years. So I think uh, the reason why I have opportunity uh, to get in touch with Nick is also actually I'm a big fan of his book, and I feel uh, through that uh, the book that the cast that he introduced is very helpful for myself. So I hope uh, that uh, today's session uh, will also be helpful, uh, and I also want to share the happiness after I read uh, Nick's book. So Nick, if uh, you are ready, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Hongyi, and uh, good evening or good afternoon or good morning, depending where you are in the world to everybody. Um, my background is really as a practitioner, and I guess although the book uh, can sound quite academic, and although I do have an academic experience of being a professor, um, it's really based on a lot of practitioner experience, um, which really was born in the military. Um, and what interested me is how to enable a, an agile uh, dynamic organization, which is absolutely critical when you're on a battlefield and everything is changing. Um, complex adaptive leadership, if you like, was a culmination of a lot of research, which really blended complexity science and if you like some ancient Chinese wisdom. Um, the, book, the book was published in uh, 2010. Um, the title 
was not really well thought out. Complex Adaptive Leadership is not a very sexy title. Um, to tell you the truth, I didn't really think it would go anywhere because complexity back then wasn't really talked about, but suddenly it caught this wave. So in 2012, we set up a business, a company, to take this thinking around the world. Um, the book then was published on a much better title uh, in China, Wei Lai Ling Dao Li, or Future Leadership. I wish I'd called the English book that, but anyway, we are where we are. Um, and uh, we started operating in China in 2016. Most, a lot of my slides here are in Chinese because I understand the majority of people here are from China. So it's with the respect I do this, I cannot speak Chinese, but at least some of my slides are in Chinese. Um, after we set up the, uh, the Chinese operation, uh, the Western operation, then um, a few years, uh, a year later, beat a lot of leading international business schools around the world for the EFMD Gold Award for Executive Development. Um, the EFMD members include in China, Zhejiang University, as well as Beijing, Tsinghua, Siebes uh, in the West, INSEAD. We didn't expect to win the Gold Award, but we did. And I think it was due to this approach that I'm going to share with you and the fact that it can get results. In 2019, we got the uh, ISO 27001 accreditation. And in 2020, we formed an international company to widen the international growth. And over that time, we've really touched several thousand executives with what I'm going to share with you. Um, at the end of the day, though, you know, the, the, the ideas in the book sound great, but the fact is, you know, can it get results? So I thought before I get into the sort of the ideas that I discuss in the book, I thought I'd just share with you some of the research that was done uh, looking at the results. And there were really three levels that I want to share with you. The first level, if you like, is at the corporate level. Uh, the second level of research was done at the team and project team level. And then the final research that was done was at the individual. So these are just three examples of a lot of research that's happened since the book came out. So looking at the corporate level, about a year or two after the book came out, um, uh, Blomberg and Oliver Weinman uh, decided to retrospectively look at five of the key competitors in the aeronautical industry and then over the five competitors, look at which ones demonstrated the CAL principles, which are described in the book. Um, and they plotted these against the EBITDA growth and revenue growth. And they found that the, the two companies that really seemed to be demonstrating what was written in the book, uh, a lot more than the others, got much better EBITDA growth and revenue growth. A few years later after that in Russia, um, similar retrospective research was done by the Tomsk University. Um, and they looked at project teams working on complex projects, software teams working on complex projects. And again, they found that in terms of motivation, knowledge management, process improvement, and quality, the project teams that were demonstrating the principles that were written in the book um, were operating at a far better level than those that were perhaps not demonstrating those principles. Those first two bits of research were retrospective. In other words, they looked at operations that were currently going on and then looked at it against the principles in the book. Um, in 2017, um, research was done looking at a slightly different uh, approach, looking at individuals who were taught this approach or who read the book and had gone through some of our programs and then looked at how well they were operating using these principles in the book. So at an individual level, you can see that the individuals themselves were getting, individual leaders, I should say, were getting a lot of good results. Um, you can see there that they were getting faster results, better work-life balance, et cetera. And also they measured the level of, if you like, financial results uh, based on you know, leadership productivity, team productivity, revenue and balance sheet impact. And they found that there was a sort of six month payback on, on the total program cost, which is unusual for a leadership program. So essentially then, um, what we really need to understand then is why is this approach working? What is the context? And why did I really write the book? Um, and, and basically, what is the global context? And I think if we're talking about the future of leadership and the future of HR, which is all looking to the future, I think we need to also maybe take a look back at the past um, and see what's been going on. And essentially, you know, for thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of years, this was how we communicated at a distance. 
and now in a space of half a generation we have this and a quarter of a generation we have that interesting that the email uses an icon from the past i think uh, young people in the future will ask what is that strange icon um, it's the same for transportation technology. For thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of years, the fastest way to cover ground was like this, and now we have this. Um, and if you look at where money is spent on technology, because it's really technological revolution, and Hung Yi mentioned AI, which is just another example of that technological revolution, most money is spent on military technology. And as, an, uh, as, a, as a previous user of military technology, I have a very simple view. It's designed to kill at a distance while you remain safe. And for thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of years, this was how it was done. And now we have this. Now, if we put this in a graph, this change that we have seen over a very short period of time is, is what we would call an anthropological shock. We don't feel it, of course, because we're the frog in boiling water. Um, but this change is really, really radical. And this is the context within which we are talking about the future of leadership and the future of HR. Because the fact is all of this change and many others have made the level of human awareness far higher. In other words, we are leading people who are far more connected and far more aware. What's interesting is 4,000 years ago in Egypt, there was only one Pharaoh at any point in time. A thousand years later in a Greek city, there was only one mayor at any point of time. A thousand years later, there was only one Roman emperor in Rome at any point in time. A thousand years later, there was only one king in a kingdom in Europe at any point in time. And a thousand years later today, well, how many CEOs do you have in your company? Typically, only one. In other words, we have changed the context of leadership far faster than we change our assumption. Our assumption of leadership is still based on hierarchy, leaders at the top, and this is a discontinuity. This is how we see organizations, and this is how we, if you like, develop leadership. And I would call this leadership 1.0. I'm not saying hierarchy is wrong. I'm not saying this is a bad way to organize. I'm just saying this lends more to the past than perhaps to the future. We call this leadership 1.0. Leadership is done by leaders. Developing leadership is about developing leaders. Um, modern day thinking on leadership can be traced to the 1850s, Thomas Carlyle. Most leadership theories look at how a leader should be. They say this is what a good leader is. Uh, and we've had quite a few, if you like, views on that. It changes from 1900 to directive leader, transformational leader, servant leader, empowering leader, resilient, agile, et cetera, et cetera. These are all based on 1.0 thinking. In other words, leadership is done by leaders and if you think about it a lot of hr traditional hr approaches are based on this thinking um to just give you three examples competency hierarchical models we have levels each level has a competency we measure it against an ideal because hr are very idealistic and have an idealistic view of what a leader a good leader should be and then against that we develop leaders um, another example is salary structures. You know, typically salary structures, the higher up the chain you are, the more you get paid. Um, another example is how we develop leadership. We develop leadership by developing leaders horizontally. You know, the guys at the top go to a nice business school, the people in the middle will get CCL and the people lower down maybe will get a local trainer. In other words, it's a horizontal approach. It's hierarchical based. Nothing wrong, 1.0 is still necessary, but it lends more to the past than to the future. So essentially what's happening in organizations though is organizations are becoming more complex. Um, to deal with complexity, organizations are becoming more complex and we need to move beyond the 1.0 to start thinking about cross-boundary 2.0. An example of that would be the matrix organization where suddenly now reporting lines are going sideways. Um, we would call this in 1.0 terms, influencing without power, but we call this leadership 2.0. In other words, going sideways and outwards. So we need to think more than 1.0. We need to start thinking about leadership going sideways along the value chain and into the ecosystem. But it doesn't stop there. I have a thought experiment for you. 
they did some research looking at major successful change programs that were successfully implemented in large complex organizations. And what interested the researchers was where did the solutions come from um, originally? So there were lots and lots of solutions that delivered change, but who thought of these originally? So they took every single solution and backtracked. Some came from the top, some from the middle, and some from the bottom. So the question I have for you, the thought experiment I have for you is of 100% of successful change solutions, these are the answers, what percent do you think were originally thought of by people at the top? So I'm launching the poll. Um, Hung Yi, can you see the poll there? Is it showing? Yes, I can see it's, it. Great. So I'd be interested if you could vote for those of you that can. I know some of you are watching this on a separate platform, but for those of you with us in Zoom, uh, we've got 20 or 30 of you. If you could vote, um, what percent of solutions do you think were originally thought of by people at the top? I'm not talking about the direction or the vision or the strategy. I'm talking about the actual answers, the solutions that actually delivered the change. And this was successful change. So. Um, what percent do you think were originally thought of by people at the top? So I'm going to um, end the polling there. Um, I'm going to give you maybe just a few more minutes if you're still not decided. So these were the actual answers. They were in the solutions, the actual answers. Um, let's end the polling. And I'm going to share the results. And you can see that most people, well, it's actually it's split. We have a split between some people think it's over 50% and some people think it's 10 to 20%. We haven't got time to discuss this. I would love to discuss this, but the assumption of a large number, the assumption of a high number is that the leaders know the answers, the leaders know. And the assumption of a low number is that the leaders don't know. And what most of you are saying, 70% of you are saying is most of the time leaders do not know. Um, and I think the research that we've done shows that the actual answer is about 10 to 20%. In other words, leaders at the top of organizations today no longer know the answers, and they know they don't know. In the old days, they turned to God. Today, they turn to McKinsey. You know, if you ever wondered why are the consultants making so much money, it's because leaders know they don't know. They get the consultants in to help them find the answers, and where do the consultants do? They go to the people at the bottom and ask them because that's where the solutions generally lie. So leadership today and in the future is about leading when you do not know, not about leading when you do know. And what we therefore need is what we call leadership 3.0. And this is about leadership going upwards. It's about leaders learning to follow the people they lead and followers learning to lead the people who lead them. And it's not, and I think, you know, 1.0 mentality would call this bottom up. This is much more fundamental than bottom up. This is about leading upwards and being prepared to be led by the people you lead and also having the honesty to say you don't know. Um, and it's not one or two or three, it's one and two and three. And what we have then is a dynamic and that's what we call leadership 4.0. Leadership 4.0 is one and two and three. Um, so we're not saying that, and this is if you like self-organization. We're not saying self-organization should replace hierarchy. I'm saying self-organization and hierarchy can coexist very successfully. For those of you who have read, for example, Reinventing Organization, Frederick LaRue, you know, he talked about the red organization, very, very hierarchical, moving all the way through to what he called the teal or blue organization, self-organization. We like to talk about a rainbow organization. This is where hierarchy and dynamic self-organization coexist. This is a much more complex way of looking at how things work. And to help us, we have a new science called complexity science. Not many people have heard of it, but what I'd like to do is share maybe one aspect of complexity science, which is biology, but it also has roots in chemistry, physics, mathematics, neuroscience. So this is hard science. And what the science shows us is that complex dynamic systems have inherent self-organization based on a few simple rules. And here's an example. This is 300,000 birds flocking. And you can see that's a very complex, um, if you like, a pattern, if you like, of these birds, which are flocking with no leadership. And all they are doing, it took 10 years to work it out. All they are doing is following three simple rules. 
And those rules are separation, alignment, and cohesion, with an underlying purpose to survive. And you can see that separation and cohesion are misaligned. So another thing that the complexity science shows us is that the simple rules and simple principles can be, if you like, in contradiction or in tension. And we'll look at that a little bit in a minute about how that can be applied to organizations. But before we go about how this is applied to organizations, let's look at how it can be applied to a human endeavor. So I have another thought experiment for you. I'd like you to imagine that you are on a tennis court with 30 people spread at random. Okay, so you're standing there and you've got 30 people spread at random and everybody, including you, needs to pick two people at random, but you're not allowed to indicate in any way who they are. So you don't know if you've been chosen um, and you don't know um, how many people have chosen you or indeed if anybody's chosen you, all you know is the two people that you've chosen at random from the 30 people standing around you. And then everybody's chosen their two people as their secret reference point. And what everybody now has to do is to position themselves at equal distance at the same time from their two reference points without talking about it. So you can see this is quite complex because I've chosen two people who've chosen two people who've chosen two people who are moving and moving and moving. So mathematically, this is very complex. So the question is, you know, what do you think will happen? Um, let's do another poll. Um, so I'm going to put the poll up here. And if you just give me a second, here we go. And hopefully you can see that poll. If you've seen this exercise, by the way, because, you know, I introduced it many, many years ago to leadership development. So it's doing its rounds. If you've seen it, please don't vote. But if you haven't seen it, what do you think will happen? Do you think it will just go on forever with people moving around like birds flocking? Um, or do you think it will settle after a few hours or an hour or after several minutes? What do you think will happen? So if you could all vote um, and then we'll see what you think will happen. Um, we've got most of you voted. Um, let's, I'm going to close the voting. If you haven't voted yet, I'll give you a few more seconds and uh, let's end the polling. And we can see that most of you at least if I will, will think it will go on forever. So why don't we see what happens? Uh, I'll run this video just for a few minutes, just to see what happens, and then we can draw some conclusions. I'd like you to position yourself at equal distance from those two people. You're not going to talk about it, you're not going to discuss how you're going to do it, who's going to do it. Obviously, if they move, you'll have to adjust. Once you're at equal distance, Stop, but it's the same move you have to start again until you get to equal distance. Equal distance doesn't have to be in between, so if it's this gentleman and this gentleman, just by doing this, I'd be at equal distance. Okay? How long do you think this is going to take? <laughs> let's see. Okay, guys, have fun. Use the space. Let's go. Time starts. Everybody laughs because if we put somebody in charge, especially if they had a 1.0 view of leadership, they'd probably be still out there trying to sort it out. Um, so, what enables that to happen? What enables those people to do this? Uh, 
This is where we have the eight principles that are needed for self-organization and agility. And you can see rather like the birds flocking, they're in slight tension. So clear feedback on the one hand, but a tolerance or ambiguity on another are in slight tension. And this is why we use the Tai Chi Tu or the yin yang um, to show that these principles are for hard, for soft. Haven't got time to go into the details of all these principles because they do have slightly different meaning under a complex environment. For example, objective setting is done by the individuals as much as the person is in charge. Um, but what's interesting is the research that we've done on these principles over the years. Um, and on our programs, we have two self-assessments, one looking at the team, which people fill out against these principles and the organization, one looking at the, their leadership, if you like. And what we find as far as the team and organization is concerned is most organizations have a good score. 70% is not a bad score. So this is um, from over 600 executives, 24 countries over the last two years. Most organizations, most teams get a good score. The highest scores are normally purpose and freedom, which is interesting because a lot of HR talk about purpose-centered leadership, but actually I think they may be barking up the wrong tree with that one because implicit purpose is generally quite well embedded in organizations. The problem is actually too many rules and not enough clear feedback is going on. And this is not the feedback in terms of the leader giving feedback. This is feedback where everybody can see what's going on. So generally though, the score is quite good. What isn't very good though, is the score for leadership. 47% um, is a low score. In other words, 53% of the time leaders are more disabling than enabling. 80% um, are far too busy. 30% um, are micromanaging and 20% don't let go at all. Um, and, and the reason for that is they don't understand complexity in a VUCA world. They're trying to stay on top of everything. So when you begin to understand the science and you begin to apply 4.0, you can get uh, much better results, much less stress, but also ask more interesting questions from an HR point of view. So from an HR point of view, you know, what can we do to motivate people is a 1.0 question, but a 2 or 3.0 question is, well, what can we stop that demotivates? You know, most people are motivated. What are you doing that's demotivating? Uh, another HR question is, well, how do we develop talent? You know, talent development, big deal. How do we develop talent? Very important. But the question, another question is, well, how can you get talent to develop the company? This is rather well like um, Steve Jobs saying, we do not hire smart people to tell them what to do. We hire smart people so they can tell us what to do. Um, another question is, well, how can leaders empower subordinates? Well, that's a 1.0 question. A 2 or 3.0 question is, well, what can we do for subordinates to empower leaders? Uh, and the hint there is, well, maybe we should stop thinking of our leaders that they know everything. They don't. And we know they don't know. So we should stop thinking or expecting them to know. That's very empowering. Um, and finally, you know, this issue of engagement, how can we engage more? Well, what are we doing that is disengaging and stopping it? So I'm not saying that two and 3.0 questions should replace 1.0. I'm saying for leadership in the future and HR, we should start thinking much more widely about these traditional views. And that is what leadership 4.0 is about. It's a dynamic. And going back to the original three things I looked at, in terms of competency models, maybe we should move away from what and simplify it and have how at all levels. Same values at all levels, rather than different competencies at different levels. Perhaps we should start thinking more widely about how we reward people and, and what we do about salary structures, and perhaps involve more decision making in how bonuses are shared out and maybe looking at output rather than input. If you look at most uh, HR management uh, structures, they're based on input. Job descriptions, where you should turn up, how long you should work, these are all industrial age thinking. We need to move away from that and start thinking about the future. And finally on leadership development, which is our, our field, instead of looking at horizontal leadership development, maybe we should start thinking about vertical leadership development. In other words, taking people from different levels and putting them through the same program together. Uh, and we find multi-directional leadership development gets much better results. Um, I'm very conscious of the fact that we've had COVID-19 as a sort of big black swan. It's not, been a, it's not a black swan, but that's another, that's another story. But it certainly caught a lot of people unawares. And it also gave us the opportunity to do some research. So what we did is we went to some of our alumni, about 100 of them, 
who'd been through our programs three or four years ago before COVID and asked them to what extent did applying Cal complex that leadership help you with COVID? Did you manage better than the people around you? And 75% said, yes, they were performing better than the people around you. Um, and what we then asked is, well, what does, what do you mean better? You know, where were you reporting better? And you can see these are the top sort of four or five benefits um, with over 60% saying much better team engagement and better results, higher productivity, less stress, faster results. We then asked, well, what are the other leaders doing then? If, if this is how you're doing, what about the other leaders, the people who are not doing so well? What's the problem there? And you can see here, this is some of the uh, comments we had, you know, micromanaging, loss of control, pressure on this virtual working, lost in the details, and this constant search for control and certainty. And I think what complex adaptive leadership gives us and the future of leadership is about leading with uncertainty, being comfortable that you don't know, navigating the uncertainty rather than trying to manage it. So I'm conscious that we're kind of like at the half hour point. Um, we had to um, end on time. So if you need more information, we have a LinkedIn page. Um, and also for those of you in China, we have a WeChat page. There are a lot of articles there with more information um, as well as obviously on top of the book. Um, but I'm very happy to take questions and I'll hand over to Hong Yi. And I hope that was my 30 minutes a little bit compressed. You might be uh, muted there. Okay, okay. This is very uh, common sentence uh, since COVID-19 happened. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> okay, so thank you very much for very impressive um, information and also the talk in the last 30 minutes. Uh, I really enjoy um, the talk that uh, you conducted, uh, particularly the poll and the Quincy, the dynamic and the people's source on that. So I think in next uh, 15 uh, to 20 minutes, uh, that will be uh, the discussion uh, time. And I will raise uh, some question to Nick. And uh, later on, we will come back to uh, the question uh, from the audience. Uh, so the first one, uh, I would like to get uh, the insight and the perspective from uh, Professor Nick is that um, it is also come, coming uh, from when I read your book, uh, because I think the idea uh, is perfect. And I think that is really the way and the direction we should uh, head for. But uh, my question here is how should we um, implement it? Uh, if that I am employee or if I am employer, because uh, eventually when we have the new a decision making process or when we have a new organization uh, structure it always comes with uh, associated with certain challenges so maybe what kind of challenges uh, could we envisage and how we should uh, tackle with it okay so i think i think the trap we tend to fall into is when we talk about let's say i mean what we're talking about here is self-organization dynamic agile self-organization and the leadership that's needed to craft that um, and i think i think the trap we then fall into is as soon as we say anything with the word organization in it we start thinking about organizational structure organizational design and i think that's a trap because i think it's more about mindset um, i think if you restructure a mindset then the organizational structure can remain one of the lessons I took away from the military, which is very hierarchical, and a lot of people see the military as top down, but that's Hollywood movie stuff. If you have a top down military, people tend to die on the battlefield. You lose a lot more soldiers uh, like that. Uh, basically on the battlefield, you need it to be agile. You need the soldiers on the battlefield making the decisions that you would normally make uh, as fast as possible. Um, and I think you can have hierarchy as well as self-organization. But for that to work, you need mindset. So it's about a change of mindset, not just a change of mindset in the leaders, um, moving away from 1.0 to 2.0, spending more time sideways and outwards, 3.0, more strategic and upwards, but also a change of mindset from the followers. In other words, stop, being, stop expecting the leaders to know and stop asking the leaders to tell you what to do. And that's a mindset change. I think one of the biggest barriers uh, for leaders is, you know, 
although they can understand this conceptually, they tend to say, well, we're far too busy. You know, we've got too many things on um, and they're like hamsters on the wheel. Uh, and essentially the first step is to actually stop and think and look at what you're doing in terms of 1.0 leading downwards, 2.0 sideways and outwards, 3.0 upwards in terms of the time you spend. And what we find is that before people come on our course, generally they're spending far too much time on 1.0. So this is about stopping doing stuff rather than starting doing a whole load of new stuff on what you're already doing. And I think that's the, the critical first step is identify what is not needed and stop doing that. Um, so this is about mindset. Um, and in terms of implementing it, the first step is stop and think and stop doing stuff that you don't need to do which gives you more time to do the more important stuff, like 2.0, 3.0, and 3.0 includes developing others so that you can be led by them. Right, right. Thank you very much for that. And I think today we uh, have uh, some uh, very active, uh, I mean, like a question uh, from the audience. So maybe I will uh, come and back uh, some question from the audience and uh, some question from myself. So here is the question from uh, Wu Kinja. Uh, I think it's very really glad to uh, see uh, you here, uh, given that Wu Kin is also one of uh, my uh, good friends here. So uh, Wu Kin's question is, do industry type post any constraint or requirement on leadership staff? Okay, well, the answer is yes and no, okay? <laughs> um, so, Yes, obviously, each industry, each country, each um, uh, area will have a different cultural view. Um, but what's interesting, so, so the way that this is, let's say, applied, the application may be different. But the basic premise, uh, and this is what we looked at after the book came out, we market tested around the world, because the premise was this is based on science. And if it's based on science and mathematics, it should work in any industry, in any country, in any level from CEO multinational to frontline factory supervisor without it being changed. But the application will look different because obviously you will apply science in one way in one job, but if you have another job, you would apply it in another way. So what we found in fact is that yes, you, you do not have to change uh, this approach because it's based on science, but the way that it is uh, applied may differ. Um, how quickly it can be embraced, again, will depend on the industry, the culture. What we find is that corporate culture is stronger than national culture. In other words, if you take a, in China, if you take a worker in, let's say, a state-owned uh, enterprise on the one hand and a worker in Alibaba on the other hand, they'll be working in very different ways, but they're both Chinese. So corporate culture is stronger than national culture. Um, and that will then dictate how fast you can implement this new mindset. Um, but we can say that it can take, you can do it within three or four months, um, maybe five or six, if it's a very traditional culture. So the constraint is not perhaps on the application, it's more on the speed of application. Yeah, I fully agree with you. I think uh, the corporate culture is very important given we know uh, one of very famous sentence of Alibaba is 996. Work from 9 a.m. to 9 p.m. and the six day per week, right? So- And, that's, and that is beginning to change, um, by the way, in, in Ali. Um, I, think, I think given the new generation that are coming, um, and I think to get to where they needed to be, that has worked very well. Um, but now I think Ali and others, not just Ali working this 996 idea, uh, realize that uh, creativity and innovation does not come from effort. It comes from something else. Uh, in order to release, release that, especially with the younger generation, um, the 996, if you like, approach over the next few years may not be the best way to continue to compete and innovate. But we shall see. Right, right. And I think here is a relevant question uh, following our discussion uh, is from uh, Olivia Wang. So how can we motivate junior level employees to be further engaged in the leadership process? 
I think that is very interesting because I think essentially I think uh, most people maybe uh, tend to get promoted and get involved in the uh, decision making process. So would you like to uh, answer that question? Yeah, certainly, Olivia. Thank you. Um, I mean, the first thing I would say is what is demotivating them and, and try and identify that and stop. Um, I, OK, so so start thinking about what is stopping them doing it and then take that out. But there's a very important thing here that can be done. The first is that I think the way leaders behave will breed behavior and followers. Behavior breeds behavior. So in order for junior level employees to be further engaged in the leadership process, leaders need to change their behavior. For example, stop giving answers. When people come to you with a question, stop giving answers and start saying things like, what do you think? Mm -hmm. And if you don't know, go away and come back with two ideas tomorrow. In other words, you need to encourage people to start thinking for themselves. Um, the other thing is we have six levels of followers, which we go through on our program, moving from followers who wait to be told and ask to be told, all the way through to followers who are self-organized and exception report. You need to understand where each individual is and each individual will be along that road at a different place. Not everybody is the same, but identify where each person is and nudge them along the road towards becoming self-led, self-managed and self-organizing. Um, it does take time. There are maps. We talk about maps in our programs. We don't have tools or methodologies. This is about maps and navigation. And I think the first step though is for leaders to start changing their behavior. If you want people below you to change your behavior, well, you can't change that. All you can do is change your behavior and then behave in a different way, which will encourage other behavior to emerge. Okay. Thank you, thank you, thank you very much. Uh, I, and I think here is another uh, question from the audience uh, on the Q&A uh, function. Uh, this is a question from uh, Modi Mowabawa uh, Kanyan. Uh, what is the reaction of leader to employees to work from uh, everywhere, uh, especially now new normal of the COVID-19 uh, and the full IR environment that is uh, forever with us? So I think uh, maybe this question, um, uh, it, 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 on the one hand side is that uh, obviously work from everywhere is like not the typical like work uh, with the office. So uh, how do we manage or how do we uh, like what kind of the style of leadership that we should apply uh, in this uh, certain scenario? OK, well, I think this goes back to the research that we did uh, looking at our alumni. Um, a lot of our alumni who'd been through the program and applying this 4.0, they, you know, the, the best quote we had was the COVID-19 is irrelevant people working from home is irrelevant, um, which surprised us. But when we asked him, um, what do you mean by that? He was saying, well, look, leadership 4.0 is about good leadership and enabling others to take the lead. And so work from, any, work from anywhere, work in the office, it's the same approach. It's the same approach to leadership, knowing when to push, knowing when to pull, knowing when to grip and knowing when to let go. So essentially one level of answer is actually this work from everywhere it's the, the problem it's caused is for people who have a 1.0 mindset. If you have a 1.0 mindset and now suddenly your team is all working from home, you're gonna have problems. If you have a 4.0 mindset, it's not a problem at all because you're enabling, you're not managing people, you're enabling them. You set the rules, you've got those principles, the yin yang principles in place to allow people to uh, focus on results and you to know when to let go, when and how to let go. So I think the answer to this, um, you know, the reaction of leaders to employees to work from everywhere, um, what we found, if I go back and share this slide with you, um, the 1.0 people had real problems. They were anxious. They were worried about the loss of control. They had a lot of pressure and this constant search for control and certainty. Whereas the people who understand how to apply what we're talking about, they had no problem at all, essentially. Um, so I hope that answers that, that question there in terms of this uh, new, if you like, reality. Um, and I think this approach, the uh, complex adaptive leadership approach or the future leadership approach, 
is very much um, helping people manage, if you like, that's the word I prefer to use the word enable, virtual teams get good results. And one of the articles we have uh, on the LinkedIn and also on the website is, you know, how to boost performance in virtual teams. Right, right. So I think that's very interesting uh, to talking about virtual team, uh, given I think nowadays when we see some of uh, unicorn or some of the startup, uh, typically maybe uh, the core team of that company, just a few people. And the most of their work in terms of uh, programming, maybe outsourcing uh, to somewhere in India, uh, the call center outsourcing to somewhere uh, in the Philippines, uh, the work some uh, where outsourcing to the Vietnam. So it seems like traditionally when we're talking about to build like the corporate culture, it's much more like uh, people, they are uh, stay in the same organization, even they are in a different location. Uh, but uh, I think given nowadays, um, because of globalization, because of uh, the internet, a lot of um, how people work and how uh, the company produce the product is also changing so rapidly. So how do you see uh, the trend for that? Well, this is um, in a way answering Adrian's question, you know, don't you think structure must support strategy? Um, and I think, you know, we're, we're caught in this old way of thinking that in order to implement, we have to have a structure of control, you know, and, and, a, and an organized structure that looks neat and tidy with people reporting here and there, and, you know, accountability is clear, etc. But I think as everything is getting more interconnected, I think we need to think, move away from that way of looking at it. I'm not saying structure is unimportant. I'm just saying that if you go and try and implement an agile organization looking at structure without looking at mindset, you're going to run into problems. So I think, you know, with this new age, this interconnectivity, we need to start thinking this is a 2.0 mentality beyond our own companies and realize we are part of a chain, a value chain in a narrow sense, but in a much wider sense, ecosystem, and start thinking about ecosystem and leadership sideways and outwards leading when you don't have, if you like, formal power, formal reporting, formal 1.0, we need to start thinking about leadership in a much more dynamic way. So I think for those who have a 1.0 mentality uh, and they see leadership in an idealistic way uh, based on levels, um, I think they're going to really struggle. I think if we have a different mindset, and this is where the future of HR is vital, I think HR can be part of the solution, but they can also be part of the problem. You know, if HR are just reinforcing their idealistic way of looking at leaders, leadership being an ideal leader, um, then that's going to create more problems, I think, in the future. It worked in the past. I still think it works a little bit today. I'm not saying you should throw out competencies and all that. But I think in the future, I think leadership is going to be much more dynamic and interconnectivity. And if we have those eight principles, as a glue, in other words, we have a common sense of purpose, but we all know our individual objectives. There are skill and the will in the system to deliver results, but we've got a few simple rules to drive behavior, if you like. Um, we've got clear feedback. People can see what's going on, transparency, but there's a high degree of ambiguity. And we have defined boundaries, but we have the freedom to act within boundaries, but cross boundaries as well. If we have those principles in place, then I think things can be much more dynamic and much more, if you like, agile. And what's interesting is organizations that if you had much more of a dispersed approach to leadership and supply chain management, managed to navigate through COVID-19 a lot better than organizations that had a very structured controlled approach um, because complex systems are messy. We have to accept that complex systems are messy and there is waste. That's the way nature works. But the good news is a few simple rules based on, if you like, self-organization, which is inherent in the system, can get results. Okay. Thank you very much for that. So uh, I think uh, also in your presentation, uh, we also uh, uh, hear about a little bit about uh, uh, AI, artificial intelligence, and how does it uh, will have the impact on the leadership. Uh, for example, that uh, in the foreseeable future, 
uh, I think that we are not going to have uh, AI employee, but also the AI manager. And indeed, it also happens uh, nowadays. Uh, for example, we uh, saw from the news that uh, Amazon also uh, used the artificial intelligence uh, manager to see like how like efficient of each of their employee. So they also uh, check that uh, should they uh, move like quickly or slowly or what's like the uh, like the, the the working style they should adjust. So uh, how do you see uh, what kind of uh, the the ASIC ethical issue or maybe uh, what kind of the problem that we should be aware with that? Okay, so there's two ways, of, uh, two, two sides of AI. The first is, you know, what's going to happen when they replace a lot of work? What, is the lead, what are the leadership implications? Yes. And I think one leadership implication is AI, similar to robotics, will replace a lot of work done by human beings. So the challenge for leadership is to stop managing downwards and start thinking strategically longer term how are we going to if you like redeploy the resources that we have um, rather than just getting a whole load of robots in and sacking everybody because essentially uh, the people who remain will probably end up um, being jealous of the people who left um, so i think the first issue of ai is what is the implications and i think the implica we've seen it before we saw it in farming where you know mechanization replaced a lot of workers we saw it in industry where industrialization replaced a lot of workers we'll see it in ai as well the second aspect which is what you covered which you talk about is you know the aspect of artificial intelligence managing people um well you know that already happens i have a phone here i wake up in the morning and i ask my phone what am i doing today i look at the diary and my phone tells me okay so i mean there's nothing new I think what's new is that you know it depends on what would what domain the work has been done. If the domain is simple, um, and then I think you know cause and effect is known, then AI uh, taking over or managing people I think is entirely natural. Um, you know I used to fly in an airplane. Don't do that so much in COVID nineteen. But there is AI in the cockpit, uh, and I like to think that the pilots you know also understand. The relationship they have with the systems that are guiding them but also when to override so one of the traps is we need to understand where those boundaries are when things are complex and dynamic um ai managing people may not be the best result so i think it's it's for each company to explore and probe to what extent can ai help let's say manage and get better results but don't fall into the trap of thinking everything is simple and people can be managed like robots. Um, if you do that, then I think it's not only unethical, but I think you'll get poor results as well. Right, right. Thank you very much, Professor Nick. So uh, I think uh, given that uh, from your background that uh, you uh, work with Army, uh, you were a professor in uh, so many leading uh, business school in Europe, and then you come to China. So. I would like to get your insight and perspective. Uh, do you see any uh, fundamental difference between uh, East and West? And what kind of difference in terms of the leadership? Uh, right. Well, the answer is yes and no, <laughs> again. <laughs> What's interesting, let me, let me go against the no first. Um, we always start our workshops by asking participants to share, you know, typing on screen, we have technology that enables that. What are their key challenges? And what we find is they type on the screen, the challenges come up and we ask them, look at the list of challenges. Do you think another group of people in another country, another part of the world will have a different list? And most people say, no, it'd be the same list. In other words, the challenges that we're facing, the conversations that we're having about leadership, the tension between, if you like, control and enablement, the tension between hierarchy and self-organization. This is happening all over the world. So it's exactly the same in China, exactly the same in the West. Um, and you know, when we talk about complex adaptive leadership, the two pieces of nice feedback, we've got one in China saying, this is the best approach from the West from China, and another feedback in Texas saying, this is the best approach for Texas. Now, I couldn't think of two opposite cultures between 
China and Texas. So the answer is no, there are similarities, but of course there are differences between East and West. And we find that the ability to think both and, which is what is needed now, hierarchy and self-organization, yin and yang, is much easier for those Asians and the Chinese because that is part of the Chinese, if you like, philosophy, the Taoism and the Tai Chi. Uh, whereas in the West, we tend to think very much black and white, either war, right or wrong, God and the devil, heaven and hell. It's very oppositional. It's either this or that. So I think the differences and what the West can learn from China is the ability to grasp, if you like, fundamental paradoxes and be comfortable with those paradoxes, which I think in China, the Chinese are far better and the Asians generally are far better at managing and thinking that way than in the West. Right. And I see there's another uh, question from the anonymous attendee. Yes. What is the role of ESG in the thinking of future leaders? Um, so what does ESG stand for? Remind me. Uh, it's uh, like the uh, social responsibility and uh, now we call environment, social and the corporate ah, governance. CSR, green CSR. Okay, yeah. corporate social responsibility. I think that as organizations become more complex and interconnected, and this is like a 2.0, we need to start thinking 2.0, sideways and outwards across our boundaries. ESG, CSR, um, if you like, a stakeholder view of corporations is becoming much more important. Um, and I think that takes time. You know, it takes time to think about these things. It takes time to start thinking strategically. And if all you're doing is 1.0 the whole time and you're not stepping back, letting go, enabling your team to get on with it, which then enables you to do these more important things that can include ESG or CSR, um, then I think you're going to be, you're going to struggle. So part of the first step is to look at what you're doing and stop doing stuff you don't need to do. So you can do much more valuable stuff, such as, for example, the environmental thinking. Um, I read today in the newspaper that I think it's something like 10% of the companies are responsible for 60% of the waste. Um, you know, we need to start thinking about how we're dealing with this planet. Uh, COVID-19 is, is not a black swan. It is just a natural event from a self-organizing system called planet Earth, where planet Earth is self-correcting because we are damaging as human beings the environment. So it will come up with ways to stop us to stop us traveling, it will come up with ways to kill us. And if we don't change our ways, and if we don't start thinking about things like ESG much more seriously, there won't be so many of us left in a few generations time.